Hi friends, I'm Misha Bruger gosman Lee, opera singer, author, wife, mom, and faith advocate. We find ourselves living through an age where our favorite pastime seems to be coming up with ever-increasing ways to take offense. But I believe our best future will be crafted by what brings us together and not by what drives us apart. So welcome to Common Ground Conversations About God, a show where you'll hear me in conversation with a wide range of artists, mentors, friends, and social advocates about, well, God, and whatever that word invokes for my guest. So I hope you'll join me here on Common Ground, where we answer the call to something higher than ourselves. I'm so, so glad you're here. First question I have is, how would the people who love you describe you? You know, it's a tough one. I don't ask them. What do you think of me? Um, you know, I... I um, and I think it would depend on who you ask. Um, I think my daughter, my 11-year-old daughter, would give you a very different answer from my 46-year-old daughter. And, uh, and my wife would give you yet another answer. And, you know, so it's hard to, hard to give you a good one for that. I mean, what I hope they would include somewhere in there is that I'm a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, he's okay. You know, something to that effect. But, but uh, um, but yeah, how would I know? What would people who don't like you, what would their issue be, do you reckon? Um, that guy's a, I, I'll tell you, what, this is a quote. That guy's a real dickhead. Uh, that was a, a quote from a musician <laughs> from, that I had met on the, on the set of Saturday Night Live. The, this is eons ago, in the 70s, when, like, or well, it would be around 1980, we played When Wondering Where the Lions Are was a hit. We were on Saturday Night Live. And I was so nervous. I was so nervous on that radio, on, on that TV show. that And, and the whole, everybody was nervous. The, the, all the, every, there was a, a, this terrible angsty feeling in the whole studio. But, um, but I, it was, I had plenty of my own. Because it was national TV in the U.S. It's a big deal. And people tried, this one guy tried to talk to me. There was a band on, with us called the Amazing Rhythm Aces that had a hit at the time. To, uh, that, that was Third Rate Romance, I think was the name of the song. Anyway, they, and they were good and whatever, but, and interesting. But, and this guy tried to talk to me, but I was so nervous I couldn't really make any kind of connection at all. And so that, you know, uh, some later on, some, he was from Memphis, those guys were, and so uh, friends of mine in the 80s, you know, years later are down in Muscle Shoals doing an album, and they met those guys that, that were all session players down there. And uh, that mentioned, you know, that they worked with me, and that's when, <laughs> when, uh, when he came up with Bruce Coburn, Da, 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 da. You know, so, so there's, there's one answer. <laughs> but it is true. Like, I can't talk to anyone. Like, I, before I go on, I'm quite sure that at any moment someone's going to figure out that they've hired the wrong person, the earth is going to open, I'm going to be swallowed whole, and then the lights come up and it's time for me to start walking. But to your point, I'm really laser focused. I think that's important, and I, I think that it's not just about nerves. I, I mean, in my case, on that occasion, it was that. I, didn't, I tend to get nervous before shows anyway, but, uh, but not that nervous normally. But um, uh, I spent a lot of time in the horse, horse world. And, oh. Yeah, I, I mean, I did. Uh, from roughly 90 to 97, I lived on a horse farm uh, west of Toronto, and we were... Uh, my, the, the gal I was with was training show jumpers. So, you know, I did a lot of riding and a, minimum, a certain amount of competing, not in the show, not in the jumper ring, but hunter shows. And, and, uh, cause they were simpler. But, you know, the thing was, you don't, you know, you're standing at the end gate waiting to do your thing. You don't want to have a conversation with anybody. You want to be focused, like you said. And, and it's, I, I there was, I'd never really thought about, performing music in those terms 
But being around that all the time really made it sink in, and it really it meant something. It was very transferable mm-hmm. to to you know my profession. I, that um, and I and I you know I make an effort to you know, I don't get to fascist about it or anything, but I I try to set things up so that I don't have to engage with people. That was my next question. Beforehand. It was like a housekeeping item about like creature comforts on the road, like having decades long in the rear view mirror as a performer, what are the must haves in addition to like being able to have a space to focus? It's, well, it's all about preserving energy for at this age at least it, it is <laughs> uh, I think at any age well but it, but it, yeah but it's uh, yeah. I, you don't know it when you're young there is a time when you think you have it to burn that's yeah. true but but um, at this point it's like I, I like to tour by bus because it's the most relaxing way for me to do it uh, where we you know we get on the bus go to sleep wake up in the next town and um, the day has a certain rhythm to it. We have our we load in time, and then a couple of hours after that, there'll be a sound check, and that'll take. I like to do long sound checks, which is part of the process too. Make, getting to feel at home in the, in the surroundings, um, and and also getting myself warm, properly warmed up, and then you know there's a break, and the people that eat dinner will eat dinner. I don't do that when I'm when I have to sing, because you know it doesn't do good things for me neither. For well, you can't you can't sing when you're going to belch, you know. So I learned that the stomach has to be empty. But but um, and I I mean I I don't really think of myself as a singer. I I get away with it. But I've learned a few things. I've learned a few things from opera singers actually about control of my diaphragm and and stuff like that and. Um, and it, uh, you know, I, I try to kind of keep that stuff in mind, but, um, but then it's, you know, it, uh, uh, we'll finish the sound check, then I, I'll have a glass of whiskey, and then I'm getting ready to go, pretty mm-hmm. much, you know, like that's, no. more warm up, and 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 if there, if I don't know what I'm going to play, then I figure that out. That's the routine. Yeah. Long sound check, which is part of the rehearsal. Yeah. Vocal warm up. No, well, I sing, but I mean, I'll sing songs beforehand, but but more the facility in the hand. It's it's mostly getting the fingers moving, and, and again, it's sort of partly an age thing. It, it, back in the day, early on, I was so nervous about forgetting songs that I, I'd have to, I'd play parts of all of the songs I was going to play during the evening, so that I, I'd remind myself that I, oh yeah, okay, I know what that one is, I know what that one is. It was that was pure nerves. I don't do that anymore. I tend if I'm if I'm going to play songs, I'll play ones that I'm not going to do in the show, and um, you know try to sort of keep that spontaneous or some freshness for the show. This question is purely for me. What would you like to do better at this point? Like there are parts of my voice that I know are fine, like the middle register. The top is sort of like. It is going to be what it's going to be, like I've made my peace with it. But it's always the evenness between the ranges that I strive to create. So it's the same voice, mm-hmm. top to bottom. It's a, that's a tricky one, and and it, it, I mean, I if I switch to falsetto to get a high note, it's probably more obvious than if you do. But uh, just, I think that's typical of male versus female voices. But it, but. I don't know. I mean, you know, I've got like an octave and a half range anyway. I mean, so without going to falsetto, so you know, I don't. All I what I try to do is just sing the right note, and and make it sound okay. You know, like, but it's all more for me. It's a lot about delivering the lyrics, and uh, and having the the voice and guitar kind of work together. The subtleties of singing for me are kind of on the back burner. Most of the time, not when I'm practicing necessarily, but but in a show, I'm not going to stop and think, "Oh, what did I just?" Do? Ooh, what was the placement of that evil? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what do you believe to be true about yourself 
And what would you want your obituary to say? I've written my obituary in so many songs that they could pick any one of them. You know, they, I mean, <laughs> I, on the new, the, the most recent album, um, When You Arrive, you know, uh, there's, it's, it's about that horizon. There's a lot of the album is actually about that horizon. Uh, I think you'd have a lot to choose from, whoever has to, whoever's stuck with that job, you know. But, but uh, how I see myself, I mean, I see myself as, as, a, as a traveler, spiritually, a lot of the time physically, but it's more about the spiritual than, than the physical for me. There, I think the, the sort of wanderlust that, that makes me want to move around physically is a product of the spiritual hunger. And, or at least closely related. So I, I, you know, the hunger is for the clearest possible relationship with God. And that's what I'm about. I, I mean, I'm lazy and I, I don't always do my homework and, you know, I get distracted by this, that, and the other thing. But, but really, that's, that's what my life's been about. I mean, if you knew how much that resonates with me. Yeah. The repenting I do is usually some way related to procrastination or waste. Feeling like something came and I didn't take full advantage or feeling like I was given something. Like my father, it's better to maybe speak about my dad because he's been in glory for almost three and a half years and he would always talk about getting to heaven tired. <laughs> like I want to show up exhausted <laughs> that's cool <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a nice vision of that I, don't, I, I just want to get there i don't care what condition i mean i, I it, it's and i fear but i my the, my biggest fear is really at least the, the, the one i'm willing to own is is about that is like getting uh, getting to the other side of that ba- boundary and being in front of god and not recognizing him <sighs> that 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 is a very disturbing notion to me and and so you know I, or to have him not recognize me you know that whole depart from me i never knew you right? yeah and well, yet i saw it. like there's real assurance like blessed assurance jesus is mine i would have foretasted glory i don't think we have to worry about that one I, I, you and I, I i some people might and i think there have been times in my life when i probably did have to worry about that and I don't take anything for granted in saying that either. But, uh, but I feel like, I mean, we have good grounds to be hopeful on that front. Mm. What do you reach for when you search for pleasure and or comfort? Not, not thinking that the two are the same. I don't even know what comfort means. I, 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 <laughs> I, I honestly, I, you know, I, I don't. I, um, I, I know what it means to escape uh, stresses, which is, I guess, what some people might call comfort. I, I've gotten pleasure out of many things in my life, if, you know, f- obvious physical pleasures, and, and I get a lot of pleasure out of playing music mm. these days. I mean, that's probably that. And I, I, I mean, I, I'll get struck by things. I, coming across the bridge, from Prince Edward Island to New Brunswick, you look at that seascape that looks like it was painted by Turner. And I mean, there's clouds in the distance and I, it was just, it was fantastic. And it's so long. And I mean, that was pleasure, pure pleasure seeing that. And, and I, I get hits of that all the time. This is a, a city that encourages that yeah. really. I'm giddy when I see the Golden Gate. Like I just get, I just can't believe somebody did that. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I, it literally fills me with joy. Just the human ingenuity. I know many lives were lost. There's so much that we just we and we just drive on it. Yeah. But, well, and, but there's a lot of tourists come down here and they walk across it. And they, they walk, bicycle, I bike cycle across, across it. Across it. Yeah, I I've it. never done that. I, it's you know I don't know. It's fantastic. But, yeah. So tell me this. When was the last time you cried? I can't remember when the last time was. Um, 
what I find is there was a time, I, it's been a very long time since I cried because I was hurting. I mean, that's like going back to the dawn of time, it seems like. But I mean, but, I, mean I used to do that. I used to do it on a fairly regular basis, even uh, into the 90s. Uh, but, you know, at, at this point, I've, uh, I remember crying about an old dog that was, that who's, uh, the dog was like, you know, 12 years old in a little lab. And his owner had died, whose owner was also old and had died, and they were wondering what was going to become of the dog. And I'm thinking, that poor dog. I'm choking up even talking about it now. And uh, that was at one occasion. That was a few years ago, though. Um, I, wh- what, I, what makes me cry is beauty more than anything now. It, with the exception of things I read in the news about the, the awful stuff people do to children, uh, that... You know, or, or the suffering that, like, some mishap, ha- like, a terrible thing happens to a kid, and, and I feel for the family, and, and that'll, that'll bring up, bring a tear to my eye. But, uh, but for myself, I don't, I, I don't know. I just, just, it doesn't seem on the radar so much. I, I, I'm not sure that's a good thing. I don't really know what to make of it, but, but it, it's, a, it's a fact. And I think, too, that the, Tear duct reaction isn't necessarily about self-motivated interests, right? Because I, that's why the question is so ambiguous, because it's not necessarily a cry of desperation. Sometimes it's like a shout of glee. Can be that. I, I, I don't know if glee, I, I mean, uh, okay, <laughs> glee, but I, I, it's not the word that would come to mind for me, but, uh, but, um, but as you get hit, struck by something, uh, it, like the, a, a vision, for me, it happens a lot with visual stuff. Like some, something I see gets me right in the heart and it'll produce tears. And I mean, it, you know, not like massive weeping, but you know, I'll get, I'll, I'll feel that. And, and I can easily imagine if anything were to happen to any of my loved ones that, it would be a very different situation from what I've just been talking about, I'm sure. But, you know, I've been spared that, and they, so have they. So, Mm. um, it's, uh, you know, I I don't, I don't know. I mean, what's, if I think of myself, it's like, what's to cry for? I've I've been given so many things. And, you know, I've got my issues, like everybody does, and eventually the issues are going to do me in. My mom, I, I grew up with, uh, you know, learning that self-pity was a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom, when she found out she had cancer, said, huh, just goes to show you something's going to get you. <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> you know? Amen. No, <laughs> you know, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I grew up with. Mm-hmm. So, you know. Because there is a pragmatism to also my mom. and. I don't see any reason to wallow in things that are promised, you know, that, well, it was always described as being broken, this temporary existence, therefore, broken things will happen, things will break. Yeah. Yeah. Now, our reaction to the brokenness and how we contribute to the healing, like, that's a different thing. Yeah, I think, on the other hand, the capacity for tears is, is, uh, can also be a measure of vulnerability, and, and that vulnerability uh, is a measure uh, in some way of our dependency on God. Mm. And if, if it's that we're talking about, then, uh, then bring it on. <laughs> weep. <laughs> Let me weep copious yeah. tears. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't do that, but, but I, I feel like there's a place for that in, in, in this picture that we're painting. Uh, and so... Um, there is a wonderful theologian named Francis Chan who I have been listening to a lot. Stephen and I have been taking in a lot only because he has this ministry of awe. Like he's been at it for decades in the ministry, vocational ministry. He's been mulling over the scriptures, just 
teasing them in and exegetically layer pull, peeling back the layers and when you get to a sort of stage of your ministry and my brother and father are both pastors where you realize that you're never going to fully wrap your mind around his vastness mm -hmm. and that it's the miracle of his unfailing love the creator of all things who then also and so it's that constant recognition that we get to live and breathe and move and have our being in his actual ness you know what i mean mm -hmm. like this trinitarian community unto himself who is the very definition of love and then i'll hear francis chan sort of say that in many different ways and it'll hit me yeah how desperate he loves us it's it's just well the paradox is hardly the word it's it's so beyond that but it's so but, beyond yet but it's it, it the way it's has struck me at various points is that is how immense it all is and yet how personal because that same being that fills every corner of the universe is right here in each of our hearts and can speak to us in in language we understand mm. like and and how does that work like that that's i i like that it's like a zen koan at that point you trying to get your head around that you can't so you you you're forced to let go <laughs> you're forced and to let and, go. and and uh yeah, I think the 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 Kabbalists call call God the boundless, which I think is really a good way of putting it. My father went to seminary after he retired from the CBC, so my brother was a career pastor, whereas my dad lived his whole life serving. People always thought he was a pastor, but it wasn't until he retired that he went to seminary. And the president at the time was Dr. Anna Robbins, who you met after hmm. your concert in Halifax. And I am now in my second year at that same seminary that my brother and father both went to right. in that order. And Dr. Anna Robbins played When the Spirit Walks in the Room at our opening chapel this year. Cool. And I have to let you know that it was really that that made me start thinking about these conversations that I feel should be happening on the nature and awe and complexity and fascination of divine. The question attached to that is, if you were to walk us through Spirit Walks in the Room, could I know a little bit about what that means for you? How that song came to be? Why that song now? Why now is is not it's it's not in my purview that it, like it it came when it came the way they all do uh, and some some of them are my, I mean are easier to trace but so that one along with several others that I can think of just kind of popped in, out and I mean popped out as misleading perhaps it you know over the course of an hour but the idea. Was just suddenly there. There were other songs, you know. I get an idea in my notebook, and it sits there for a while, and then another idea will come along, and and then, uh, you know, they'll, it'll connect to something, and whatever songs come that way. But but some songs just happen, and that one did. And uh, I'm mean, just sitting upstairs in the dining room, um, working on it, and it's like, holy jeez, I got a new song. You know, it's like <laughs> that's that's that's. Uh, you know, I don't know if I can say much more about it. It just seemed, it probably came, let me just think about this now, because a lot of those songs of late have come from uh, things that uh, have been triggered by um, my pastor's observations, sometimes in a sermon, sometimes not, but, but just um, the... Uh, you know, Jeff Garner, he'll say something and, and 
sometimes what I take from it isn't what he, where he was going with it, but, but it, it just triggers something. And um, I'm not sure that that song is, fits that category, but it might, it might have. And from a like, theological perspective, for somebody who wouldn't know what that image means, could you unpack that? Uh, with, I, I will. I'll try to. I don't like to look a gift horse in the mouth in a way. Right. So where does it come from? I, I mean, I know what I meant by all the stuff that's in it. Uh, and I know what my vision is of this, which wouldn't necessarily fit various orthodoxies. But uh, to me, I mean, we know that everybody's forgiven. So really, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It does matter. There's, I mean, your choices matter. But for the purposes of, of how the Spirit works among us, it doesn't matter. The spirit is going to get the job done regardless. You can stand in the way and you'll get run over. You can dodge and you'll be bypassed. That's your choice. Or you can go with it. And, and, but, but the spirit's going to get it done no matter what. So that's kind of where the song is going. And, and the, one, the one line I was sort of, I, where I had questions for myself about, which I never totally satisfactorily answered, is, is the line about we play the role we're made to play. And uh, the question isn't so much what I mean by it as whether people will misinterpret it because I, it doesn't, to, it's not intended to be fatalistic. It's not intended to be, you know, okay, this is, this is the course you're on and there's no changing that. It, it does refer to what I was just saying about the fact that, that what must happen will happen, mm. no matter how you hold yourself in, a, in opposition to it. How much does it have to do with the many are the plans of men, but it's the will of God that will be accomplished? Well, basically that. That's, that sums it up, yeah. I mean, why did I bother writing this song? I could have just said that. <laughs> <laughs> Some people have all the luck. Hey, just come up with a simple no, I, mean, I did not write that. No, no, but I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. But to that point, like when you... Go to God's word. Is there a place you gravitate to naturally? Like, I don't want to assume that as somebody with a Davidic anointing that you would go to the Psalms. I don't want to make that assumption. I would, I would genuinely love to know if there's anywhere you gravitate. I love going to Hebrews. I can't believe the theology contained in Hebrews. There's something about the old, the, the Pentateuch, just the way he moved. I get more out of poetry than I do out of most of the Bible. I mean, every now and then something will jump out. I do read it, and I'll tr I try to make a point of it. But but it, and I there was a day when I read it cover to cover way back when. But um, but it, it, there's as much to be disturbed by in there as there is to be inspired by, and and um, which is part of the fun in a way. But uh, think you know from our historical perspective. But there's. You know, I have a friend who, who teaches uh, Old Testament theology. I went to one of his lectures, and he's talking about this a passage, and I don't remember where it's from, that involves rape and mass murder and all this stuff, right? And and uh, it's not talked about in a judgmental way in in the where it appears. It's just this is what happened, you know. And it, it, the cumulative effect of a lot of these kinds of things, plus the good stuff is kind of what, what uh, when the Spirit walks in the room, was trying to say is that, look at us, we're all these things. But, you know, the Spirit is here for us. I, but I've, in terms of, of being influenced as a Christian, I, I probably got more from Teilhard de Chardin and C.S. Lewis and uh, now other people, I mean, even T.S. Eliot in the poetry and... and uh, uh, and young, younger people, but stuff I run across every now and then mm. that just has that flash of connection uh, that, that, where you feel the inspiration that, that the writer was feeling. Yeah. And it comes through and it's like, oh, wow, you know, I can feel that too. It leads me to ask you how you consume information, like how you consume what will later sort of show up in your work, whether it's poetry or the news, or 
How do you take it in? Like logistically, do you put it on the computer? Are you listening to the radio? Is it a podcast? Like how do you take that in? I read way too much online news. Uh, and I mean, I'm kind of addicted to that, I suppose. But, um, I mostly read sci-fi and detective stories. I, you know, I'm like not always, not, not a hundred percent, but, um, but a lot of that. I have a, a bigger leap to get to kind of the intellectual content of nonfiction stuff. So I, so I read less of it. Mm-hmm. But um, it's every now and then, though, there was a, a book, uh, a, a biography that I read recently of, of a guy that I knew, uh, Gustavo Parajon, who was a, a, he was a pastor in Nicaragua. Uh, when I met him in the 80s, he, that's where I met him. And we both were guests at the Greenbelt Festival in England a number of times. And so we, you know, acquaintanship kind of kept up over the years in a, at, at a distance, but he was a really great guy. And, and, and somebody wrote a, a biography of him, but not an especially great piece of literature, but the stuff, you know, Gustavo comes through in this fantastic way. Like what a character he was, who under the Somoza regime, the dictatorship before the Sandinistas took over, uh, because it, the dictatorship wasn't interested in the people at all, as, as long as they played ball and, you know, whatever, they, they didn't give them anything, but they didn't bother them. Uh, but that meant they had nothing. They had no education. They had no medical mm. su- support of any kind, et cetera, et cetera. So Gustavo was out there. He, he created uh, a system for a f- kind of transient doctors that could go from t- village to village in, in the countryside and and they were training young people to, to be kind of health practitioners of a, of a sort, like first line of defense sort. And, and, uh, this, when the Sandinistas took over, they were suspicious of the church in general because the, a lot of the church was opposed to them. They were more on the side of the status quo. But, um, they liked Gustavo because he had been working with the poor and he was, he, you know, and he, he was trained in the States. I mean, he's a very well-read, well-traveled, you know, cosmopolitan guy, but, but com- completely committed to what he was doing in Nicaragua and to building peace everywhere. And he did, he, in his later years, he spoke a lot and at, all, all over the world about that. There was a, an instance of a nonfiction book that actually had an effect on me. I don't think it showed up in the songs particularly, but. But um, there is that activist spirit that has been the thread throughout your career like absolutely understanding that it is for the people who have a voice to speak for those who do not or, yeah i think so i mean i think and and for all of us to do whatever we can to leave our campsite better than we found it <laughs> that's that's what i was taught as a kid camping you know and 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 it's it's it applies to the whole planet and all of us, you know. Yes, and to the place of privilege that we're put in to not just be carriers of gifting that allows us to express it musically, which is already like the best thing ever, but then to also fashion that music in a way that allows people to know that people are really suffering, starting perhaps with Mother Earth. Yeah, well, yeah, starting and ending. And in between there's us. And, and, and it's, yeah, I, mean, I, I've, I have less contact with, uh, with that activist world now than I used to, considerably less. But, uh, but it made an impression on me for sure. And I've, I met a lot of great people. Uh, who continue to do the work they were doing, some of them, and some of them are dead, of course. But um, th- there's a crossover there. The, my my professor friend that I mentioned a minute ago was Bob Eckblad, and they, Bob and Gracie uh, were missionaries in Honduras when I first met them. 
missionaries, quote unquote, they had gone down there as idealistic young Americans right out of college to go be, you know, to go help the poor and spread the word, spread the gospel. And they got there and then they, they realized that the poor were starving and, and, you know, they were already Christians. They didn't need to be converted or baptized. They needed food. They needed food. So they got involved in agricultural stuff that, uh, you know, like helping people grow their own food. And then that led to them being viewed as subversive by the powers that be because there goes, you know, if, if, if all those poor people can feed themselves, there goes your cheap labor force when it's harvest time. It, the cause and effect just piles up and piles up and piles up. And, you know, they, they now are uh, in training pastoral, they, they have, they have a, a course that they give in, in being a pastor. And they've, they go all over the place. They go to Zimbabwe, they go to Siberia, they go to Morocco. They, uh, they're doing all this stuff um, that is, it's not development work in the normal sense, uh, in the conventional sense of the word, but they're working with people who are severely disadvantaged, for either because they're refugees in a hostile uh, new environment or because they're people who, who really need each other. And this is one of the side effects is, is that they can, you know, the, the, it builds the community around that, so, which benefits everybody. So it's, that stuff still goes on. I, but, uh, but that's the angle of it that I see up close more now than, than what I was doing back in, in the 80s and 90s. You mentioned that you have a 46-year-old and 11-year-old, and I'd love to know how God has influenced your parenting in the two scenarios and two different stages and seasons of your life. I have an 11 year old, mm -hmm. an incredible boy named Shepard, uh, and an eight year old and a beautiful boy named Sterling. Great. So I, I'm quite keen and I inherited beautiful children from my husband, Stephen, uh -huh. 30, 25, 23, and 20, maybe? And 20. That's a crowd. Yeah. You got. And two grandbaby. Yeah. And so I'm sort of asking for us both. So, well, yeah, I mean, it's a lot changed between <laughs> my older daughter's birth and my younger daughter's birth. I mean, they're, my older daughter's mother and I split up when she, when my daughter was three and a half. So after that, I was the only second weekend dad, basically, and therefore had only a limited amount to do with shaping her. And, and with the responsibility that goes with having a kid. So I, you know, I was off the hook a lot, uh, in, in that situation. So I don't know if I can really draw much of value. I mean, except that I learned later. I mean, at, her name is Jen. When Jen grew up and we could have conversations about the past, et cetera, that meant something, then, then I learned a lot from that and from, you know, just from interacting with her when she, once she was like in her teens and not a kid anymore. And, and it, you know, I think the learning kind of started then for me. Um, in the new situation, um, Iona's her, that daughter's name, my, my 11 year old's name. I mean, I've been around the whole time. I was there for both their births and, and both the births were kind of exhausting. Even for me as the bystander, never mind for the mothers involved. But, but, uh, the, the, um, like we had, the, I don't know, it was a 75 hours of labor. It was, it was brutal. And, and, uh, yeah, not, not nonstop. I mean, yeah, it just, it was rough. But, but, um, uh, but out came this little kid and, you know, She's a lovely girl and, and smart and I, I'm kind of in love with her, yes. you know, and I'm around all the time. So at least when I'm not on the road, but you know, this morning, I, you know, uh, the routine is because I'm on the road a lot and my wife has to, she is working from home since COVID, but, but whether it's home or not, she's got to be up and functioning around eight, eight in the morning. So, so I drive our daughter to school. But when I'm out of town, then we've worked out a carpool plan with one of our 
one of the other parents, and so that doesn't live too far away from here. So when I'm here, every morning I'm up at 6.15, I get in, you know, get in the car and I drive these two kids to school. And, <laughs> and then and, and the other dad drives them home in the afternoon, most days. But when I'm away, then, then, you know, I go back to my other life as the guy that tells everybody what to do on the tour bus. And <laughs> it is you know, a, like, a wonderful, I feel as I get older, especially the privilege that that is, I sometimes felt, and I didn't have children till later, not as late as you, but I, I really had limited options. Like I had to get it going or well, decide not to do it. You're listening. a woman. <laughs> So and far, I mean, so far, yeah, it's it's heading in a different way. Let the anyway. record show that I would have a third one, like, and I'm yeah. happy. But the point is, like, I at this point in their lives, when we do the school runs, and they go to school like 32 minutes away, so we have a good like conversation. We're able to, I'm able to hear what's happening. I hear what they're fighting about. I hear what they agree about, right. and it's. I didn't know in terms of like my own faith my own consequence like when i hear my mouth on their faces and i realize that for better or for worse mm -hmm. that kind of imprinting their mannerisms like in how they are i i was not ready for that what has surprised you about this time around it, yeah there's the big oopses like that, you know, I mean, they're, they're, that come around every so often. There's something that, you know, I'll see some aspect of myself reflected in not so much of my older daughter at this point. I mean, she's got her own life and she has four kids and they're, they're you know, she's got a PhD, et cetera, et cetera. But with Iona, they, that she'll come out with something that I see myself reflected in. And, and I think, you know, that wasn't what I intended to teach her. But, <laughs> but, but once in a while, I see something come out that maybe I did teach her, you know, mm. Mm. Uh, an appreciation of, of this or that. It's a little soon to tell. I, I, I hope I'm around long enough to kind of see her through her teens and, and you know, and what comes out the other side of that. Sure. I'm going to wrap us up. I praise God for your life. I'm so grateful for all the time. I would ask three final questions, super deep. Favorite food on the road? <laughs> I've signed on so many diets, I can't eat anything. On the road. <laughs> my, my favorite, my, what I have for breakfast on the tour bus is instant oatmeal and berries. And, and I like to put half and half on it. And, and um, you know, and a coffee. Mm. That's my breakfast. But I'm not supposed to eat anything with salt in it. And I'm not supposed to eat anything with potassium in it. So, I mean, this is between those two things. There's about four or five things that I'm actually supposed to eat. I cheat, you know, in both directions. But it, but uh, that's kind of the habitual meal. That's on the tour bus. I can warm it up in the microwave, you see, mm -hmm. whenever. So, um, and what was, it, what was your next meeting? Deep question. Deep question. Before we leave this latest assignment, how would you feel would be a, your life described as a success? Like what would constitute success? You're standing in front of your heavenly father. I also want to know what you think what, ha what happens when we die. But you're standing there. What would be the resume that you'd want him to look at? Not that he doesn't know everything anyway, but. Oh boy, you know, I mean, I, I, I think this is a mistake, but I haven't got over it yet. Uh, but. I, I'm reluctant to assign myself any, any plea. Like, I don't, I'm not going to stand in front of God and go, yeah, but I did this and I did this and I did this. Like, you must owe me something for that. Like, I, I, there are no brownie points. You just, I, I believe that I'm loved. And I believe that when I'm standing in front of God, if, if we visualize it that way, and I'm not sure I do, but, but that in some form that'll happen and uh it'll be here i am take it you know take the whole thing and fix what what you need to fix if but i, I you in, know if i slip in 
just needle in the the perfect and finished work of Jesus Christ and the man Jesus and wanting to hear just your perceptions of him, where he exists, where he positions himself in your faith or or just what you think of him. It comes and goes. Um, I had a couple of encounters with who I think was him back in the day. I haven't had one for a while. Well, actually... Interesting. I'll tell you one, the most recent one, which was a few years ago now, but, but I was in church. Uh, the, there was somebody, a guest, doing the speaking, uh, delivering. It wasn't exactly a sermon. It was just t- talking about some stuff. I can't even remember what she was talking about now. But, but she was inviting us to the congregation to kind of meditate on what she'd been talking about. And, uh, I, th- and I, I, so okay, I close my eyes and I'm, I don't remember what I asked. I did ask something like maybe, you know, can I see you, Jesus? Or, or uh, that's a paraphrase, but something along, along those lines. And with my eyes closed, I see this seascape. And, and away in the distance, there's this little speck and it's moving closer and closer and closer. And, and, but moving at, at this, you know, the speed of flight across over the surface of the water and it's and it's jesus but it's the jesus in the in the the those sort of renaissance paintings of where he's with the robes and the sacred heart and of, on on his chest and and it's and there he is like he didn't say anything but he's right there and 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 i was shocked because at the i was shocked at the vividness of this picture that came out of nowhere and at the I had to laugh because I've always been judgmental of those kinds of images of Jesus, you know. So here I am. It's like, yeah, you want to be judgmental? Judge this <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> you know, but basically that's what was coming, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, so brilliant! It was it, it was great. It, 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 it was really profound. I mean, my other encounters with him were more personal in a way because it was. I, I, on two different occasions, I had the sense of a person being in the room with me that was invisible, but was so tangible. Uh, and, and the energy was like, it was, we talk about in terms of an, a being of light, but there was no light involved. It, it, but it had that effect, you know, as if it were, you know, so I, I, I have pretty vivid memories of those experiences, but, but, uh, and the th- you know sometimes these things creep into songs. That particularly the seascape one didn't, but it made a huge impression on me because just the the message to me seemed to be the cliches are not what's important here. It's the fact that that they're talking about me. This is Jesus saying this. You know, like there's people are, people paint pictures of me. Nobody knows what I looked like. People people are going to say things about me and they don't really know what they're talking about. But they're talking, they're, they're putting their attention on me. And that's what they need to be doing. And that's what you need to be doing. So, okay. And I also think you know. that just the action of the math of seek, find, ask, answer, knock, open. And you asked and he came. Yeah. That's what I think is. I've asked other times and he didn't. But, uh, but, you know, I mean, there's an, an, another episode that's a little different, but uh, th- it shows up in one of the songs on the, on, on O Sun, O Moon that, that the, I was sitting at the kitchen table in the place we lived before we moved into this house. And uh, it, it might have, it was probably during the COVID thing shut down. Um, and I just asked for, an, it, I just wanted to feel love. And I asked for that. And I had this sensation. I, I, I mean, again, you know, if I shrink and hear this and go, oh, well, let me explain. But, it, but, uh, but I'm sitting there and I, and I, I, I felt like this, the, like warm honey was dripping down over my head and spread and dripping down over my whole body. It was the most delicious sensation. And it was in response to, to that request. And I, you know, as I'm talking about it now, I think, why don't you ask for that every day, dummy? But you know, <laughs> I don't feel it every day. But I, but I, I sure did then. And you know, 
So I'll tell you on your image of him coming across the water, I in one of the one times where I really asked for his presence, needed it, was quite desperate. I was in just this intersecting situation where I had to perform. I did not want to. It was a ton of pressure. And you can conjure up any number of these moments, I'm sure. And I just was like, I don't have it. I really don't. And it was in COVID and it was yet another one of those projects that I had to make happen. And I was trying not to lose my house and keep my children housed. And I just had to do this super mundane thing that would get me paid. And we live remotely, like in the, at the back of a a half kilometer long driveway surrounded by a lake. So there's a lake and we look right out onto it. And my mother was there and my children were there and there was a videographer there and everybody was waiting for me. And I was really knowing that n- nobody could do. It's like those instances where, you know, it's only you. Everybody is waiting for you. They need you. They've only asked for you. It's your voice, your guitar, your presence, your songs. And I was so tired. I was so tired. And my mother went to open the front door for some fresh air and i heard this rust this big rust like a storm and i had assumed it was her opening the front door but then i looked up and i saw this massive cloud of white coming through the trees on the other side of our lake and my mother came in and she gasped And so I knew that she'd seen it and it wasn't the front door. And I knew it was the Holy Spirit. Like I knew. Yeah. I knew. And it, and, and to the point where the immediate response is fear because Shepherd was down on the lower level of the deck. So between me and the Holy Spirit was my son. Mm -hmm. And so we opened the door quietly and it started rushing and moving on itself and turning over on itself. It was very directional. And it came out of the trees, like it came down the cutting through the cheer- trees across the lake. And then I was like, shepherd, shepherd, shepherd. Cause I was, you know what I mean? Like you can't imagine it's, be- he's between me and this forest. And shepherd, I said, do you see that baby? Mama, do you see that? And we all saw it. Cause I was like, please, God, don't let, at least don't let me be crazy. Like I'm so upset. I could be hallucinating, but at least there are witnesses. And it came close and it stayed there and then it went down the lake and it said in my spirit, I'm with you. Yeah. Wonderful. That's really great. I mean, scary, but great. Super scary. Yeah. But I said, I will tell whenever I can that story because it's the testimony. Mm-hmm. Like they will know us. It's the revelation, right? They'll know you by my blood and the words of your testimony. And so the last question I want to ask, and I'm super sad that it's the last question because I really loved hearing what you had to say, is how will they know? How will the truth of the gospel as evidenced in your life create the oneness that we desperately need. And I'm not saying it's your responsibility. I don't make it may want to make it sound like the onus is on you, but from your and I, I what I would say from my puny perspective, from my puny compared to what God is and how vast and how he knows everything and is moving and working everything all together for his good, what is your contribution to that everything? You know, it's, uh, again, it's one of those things I don't like to look at too closely, but, uh, what I, what I hope is happening and will continue to, and, ha- and I think has been to some extent based on feedback I get from people now and then is that through the songs, I'm not a good example of anything, but, but the songs are, uh, are gifts you know, delivered, you know, passed on to in varying degrees of imperfection. But 
but uh, in those songs and, and in, the, in their capacity to touch people, I hope that people will be, will feel the spirit in, in, in those songs. And I know that that's happened for some people some of the time. Um, and I'm encouraged by that. And, you know, at the end of it all, how big a deal that is in, in the cosmos is not up to me. Uh, or how small a deal it is, for that matter. But but uh, I feel like I'm I'm part of the flow to the extent that that's happening. I mean, in other ways too. But that that's what matters to me uh, in terms of of uh, of my effect on anything outside myself. <laughs> I guess. I'll end in prayer, if that's okay. Yeah. Can you? Give me praise items and prayer requests. I think that, uh, to me, a big thank you is in order. It always is. It's the thing I remember to say most often is, is thank you. And, I'll, and I'll, so we can say that again. Yes. Oh. Holy Spirit. Jesus, God Almighty, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you for your awesome supremacy, for your sovereignty. God, we want to thank you for the spirit that continues to flow through your son, Bruce, as he does his utmost in all of us in our imperfection as we try to simply serve you in this temporary place. We pray that you would find favor with our paltry offerings. And as you add to us and strengthen us and give us more of your supernatural essence, I pray that we would continue to just rid ourselves of all that is unnecessary. That you would help us to identify and unload what is unprofitable for the kingdom. That God, there would be a purity of spirit that continues to flow through Bruce as he goes on tour, that you would bring strength to his body, that you would raise him up like the wings of eagles, that he would run and not grow weary, that he would walk and not grow faint, that Father, everything he touches and all of the parenting he does and in his marriage and in his music making and in the interactions that he has with presenters and in his relationship with Bernie, that God, you would be glorified, that you would be lifted up, that you would find favor with your son, Bruce, and that his ministry would continue in places that we'll never see in conversations that we'll never be a part of. And we just praise you that you're always working. There's always something going on. And that you continue, and we praise you for this, to dispatch your angels concerning Bruce, concerning each and every member of his band, the bus driver, the roadies and, and equipment carriers and sound men, and for the bums in the seats at all the halls, God, the people he'll never meet. Would that that would somehow mysteriously continue to renew his strength continue to be the example that Iona needs to move forward into whatever generations will flow from here. We thank you for his ministry, for his life, and for this time we've spent. Would that you would multiply all that we've experienced here for the oneness of this year creation in this temporary place until we are united and reconciled with you. Amen. And um, yes. lovely. Beautifully articulated. You do it in song. I love praying. I have a I pray and pray. Thank you for joining me on Common Ground, Conversations About God, where the conversation, just like God, can literally go anywhere. <laughs> I'm Misha Bruger Gosman Lee, and I hope you'll take a minute right now and receive the love that is always available to you from the one who made you, who sees you, and who hears you. Why not meet again on Common Ground and have others join us? Until next time, I love you. <laughs>